Hello, how are you doing? Recently, I read with my online book club and really enjoyed Northwoods by Daniel Mason. We had so much great discussion about this book. And I thought rather than me make a video where you watch me talk about all of my thoughts and feelings about this book, I would discuss it while demonstrating making a recipe because one of the main aspects of this book is about apples and apple farming. So I am going to attempt to make an iced apple bun recipe and I've never made this before so I'm not sure how it's going to come out and it's quite a long recipe because uh, you have to uh, make an, a bun dough which has to rise multiple times so we'll see at the end how much it resembles uh, this photograph and more importantly how they taste. Um, so I have a bowl here of uh, Braeburn apples. Um, I don't have the kind of of apples which uh, inspired Daniel Mason um, partly to, to write this, this novel or at least the, the apples in the book because I heard him talk about in an app in an interview um, how he tasted this particular kind of apple called Ashmead's kernel um, which sounds so complex and interesting and good even though he said it kind of looks like a potato um, but, but yeah I have some Braeburn apples here which I'm gonna make into this recipe and and uh, yeah, well, we'll see how it comes out at the end. But yeah, overall, um, such an enjoyable novel. It took me a little bit to get into this book and I've heard that from a number of different readers because um, it starts off de dealing quite fleetingly um, with some characters and using different styles of writing but I quickly caught on um, that this book is more about a single location because it begins with the birth of a structure from the laying of a foundational stone in the forests in New, New England and then follows this yellow house um, throughout the, the centuries and I think it's only natural when reading a novel that will um, find a character or a group of characters um, that we latch on to and we follow their narrative over the course of the book. But this novel is more about this single structure and following the, um, I guess you could call it the life cycle of this structure over this long period of time. And so time starts to develop a really strange and different thing over the course of the book because you're following it over um, this, this span of time, which is very different from a normal human's lifetime. So as, as soon as I let go of following any one individual's journey, I really got into this novel. And of course, later sections of the book, um, they become much longer dealing with characters' lives so I could get more into um, their stories. And in particular, a soldier um, slash fruit enthusiast um, and his daughters who, um, who cultivate an apple orchard and become apple farmers and following their stories. So I will get into making this iced apple bun recipe and we'll see how it comes out. As each section of the novel leaps forward through the decades, there's a poignant accumulation of the stories of people who preceded living in this abode. Traces of those who've previously inhabited the house remain. I like how Mason is building a layered sense of time. I've always found it touching to think about who might have lived in my house before me and who might live here when I eventually leave. There's a strange intimacy knowing we've shared this same physical space, but we'll probably never know anything about each other's lives beyond changes made to the home's structure. Who knows what drama played out in this same space? That's what the author shows us, tracing this line of inhabitants. And I think it's very clever how this accumulates into a special poignancy. The way Mason mixes songs, articles, and maps into the narrative adds to this because this documentation tangibly shows the traces of those who've lived there before. I know for some it might feel jarring to be pulled out of the flow of the story by these, but for me at least, it adds another dimension to the novel and makes the Northwoods feel like a real location imbued with so much history. 
I also enjoy how the author interjects some occasional humor, such as a joke about a trick played on a thieving farmer family, or a minister's theory about that the events of the Bible. Had actually transpired in New England with examples of potential parallels. These little asides are welcome since there's a lot of serious drama in this book. I must admit that the novel stirs sentimental feeling in me as well, since I grew up in New England. The descriptions of the seasons and the natural environment are very evocative. I appreciate the mention of specific things such as a regional flower called lady slippers and chickadee birds, which I was very familiar with when I was young. At the same time, larger American conflicts throughout different time periods seep into the experiences of people who pass through the same house. Mason evokes a strong sense of atmosphere, though sometimes his descriptions can lapse into cliche. In the first forty pages, I noticed he used the same adjectives. Quote, Violet consumes the lemon yellow wings of the viburnum, and quote, she looked then much as she does now, a clean facade of lemon yellow. This particular phrase always stands out to me because I heard a creative writing instructor once say it's better to describe something as lemon yellow rather than as yellow because it creates a stronger sensory experience for the reader, and that's true. But it's now become overused. However, that's a minor quibble in an otherwise beautifully written story. As I continued to read this novel, I felt a building anticipation to discover who might inhabit this location next. The form of narrative also continuously changes, and I especially enjoyed a chapter composed of letters written from a painter to a poet. I'm a sucker for a tale written in epistolary form, especially one set in the distant past, where you know the mail took a long time to reach its destination. So there are interesting gaps and experiences which must have occurred between the correspondence. Again, to some readers, the changes in narrative might feel disruptive, but I found it refreshing. It's also impressive that Mason can convincingly write in many different styles, from true crime pulp to notes for a lecture intended for a historical society. As much as I enjoyed the whole novel, some sections would have felt melodramatic and over the top if I'd read them. In isolation, so I don't think you can really call this a book of short stories. It is definitely a, a novel,、um, even though each section is written in a different style and involves different characters. So, for example, there's this one section that has a sensational. Seance, and this just wouldn't have had the same effect、um, if you had just read this part on its own. But I think that's because it's set in a single location and continues to involve previous inhabitants. So there's an added pleasure and meaning to the book. And I know some readers have been put off by supernatural elements in the story. To me, this. Felt playful, and I enjoyed the the Beetlejuice vibe of it. But it also adds to this progressive layering of history, which Mason builds. It's also a book that kept me on my toes. The characters change from section to section, so I have to reorientate myself in new stories. But also, the author changes his style of storytelling and even moves into the consciousness of a beetle. This was very funny and unexpected, and it's also inventive how it's incorporated into the overall plot and changing natural landscape. The narrative seamlessly slides between the micro and macro in this way, yet always revolves around this one house. I also appreciate how this is represented in the imagery set between sections as well. There's a map of marked trees in the area, but also the paths 
carved by the beetles. When viewed from this perspective, such landscapes become both large and small. It's an artful way of referring to larger stories of people and the nation while selecting to focus on certain pieces of it. It was such a pleasure to read this novel, but it's also challenging because I'd like to spend more time with certain characters, such as that lively medium named Anastasia. However, the structure of the book necessitates moving on from them. I found I had to modify my expectations and not grow too attached to characters, yet the more the novel went on, the more pleasure there was in picking up on small details which referred to characters who previously inhabited the house. There are also quite a few instances of coincidence in the story for the sake of the plot, which tie all the sections together. And I'm in two minds about it because on the one hand, it makes a very satisfying story where indicators of previous residents appear more and more as the book goes on. But on the other hand, certain details feel so improbable. For instance, a letter written by a kidnapped woman that was tucked in a Bible and taken to Canada finds its way back to the region and comes to a professor's attention after multiple generations. And of course, chance findings and occurrences like this happen, but it can sometimes feel a little too convenient for the plot. And certainly this isn't a novel that's aiming for strict realism since it becomes increasingly supernatural. After a certain point, the story becomes so wild in its evocation of the dead and their interaction with the living, but the environmental concerns of the novel grow at an equal pace. These two subjects come together in the most beautiful and moving way in the final section of the book, which shows how the world itself operates on a very different clock from humans' conception of time, that the experience of our lives is so ephemeral compared to the surrounding forest and the structure of the house itself, which gradually degrades with only brief instances of remodeling and repairs. Certain objects, which might easily be overlooked take on such significance. So when later characters enter into the house, the reader is aware of the meaning of things, whereas to these characters it appears like a lot of old clutter. There's a line from a later chapter of this book that I want to read aloud. She was struck by the discrepancy in meaning the belongings presented, that death meant not only the cessation of life, but vast worlds of significance. This feels poignant and relevant to a lot of what Mason is doing in this novel. The lives and struggles of these vibrant characters come to feel small when considering the vastness of time in a certain location, yet traces remain even when their meaning has been lost. This has been such an enjoyable novel to read, especially at this time of year, because the sections set in the winter are so vivid. It's only 369 pages, but it feels like a much longer and epic novel, but in a good way, like I've fully experienced the yearly cycles of this house over centuries and also the accumulating weight of experience from all the residents and people who've passed through this location. The ending is incredibly poignant and it has such a haunting effect. I'm going to be thinking about this novel for a long time. And there we have it, my iced apple buns in honor of Northwoods. I wish I could convey the smell of cinnamon and sugar that is coming from these buns and that's filled this room since I was baking them. I think I did a fairly good job. It's, it's a bit close to the picture. As with all recipes, it's like a trial and error to see what actually works and what works with your equipment. Um, the, the most noticeable difference is the icing sugar. I, I did add more and more icing sugar, um, as you saw, because 
because it didn't feel like it was quite thick enough. But then I had added almost double the amount of icing sugar and thought I should stop. But now it's almost completely disappeared after I drizzled it on these buns. Now, of course, the real test is going to be in tasting them. I am going to take one off, in and they've um, they're still a little bit warm. And uh, hold it under this plate because I, I don't I don't want an apple to spill on top of it. So let's have a try. Hmm, that is nice. Um, the the dough is a bit firm. Uh, it didn't rise as much as I was hoping it would. So I think maybe um, a bit lighter dough. I, I'm not sure what. I did wrong with that. Um, I usually, to be honest, when I make my dough, I usually like to knead it by hand rather than using a dough hook. But there you go. So that was, um, yeah, yeah, that tastes quite nice. And I'm glad how that came out. Um, I did put the recipe all below. So um, if you want to try making these yourself, um, please let me know if you're going to or if you do and how they, they come out and what you think about it. But um, also, if you have read Northwoods, let me know what you think of this novel because, yeah, I enjoyed reading this so much. Um, as you can tell, it's such an imaginative journey. Um, so many interesting characters and the structure of it builds to say something um, much bigger than I think any one individual section um, throughout this novel. So really enjoyed it. Had such a great discussion with my online book club. And uh, yeah, it was a wonderful choice for winter. Um, so let me know um, if you do read this book or if you're planning on reading this book or if you've read anything else by Daniel Mason, because this is the first novel I've read by him. I know he's written a few novels before and um, I've heard really good things about them. So I'm anxious to read more by him because he's obviously such a creative writer. So I hope you enjoyed this slightly different take on uh, discussing a book um, while showing a recipe. I haven't done this um, since I uh, made a review of Nora Extena's novel Soviet Milk while making uh, my Latvian bacon and onion roll recipe um, that, that I got from my family and um, which uh, is a different way of talking about the, the novel. But I'd like to do more of these. It does take quite a lot of work, but um, it was a lot of fun. And I still have some apples left because I would like to eat an apple. Would you like an apple? <laughs> I don't know why, but I'm completely obsessed with that line that Maya Rudolph gives in the movie Bridesmaids. <laughs> anyway, enough silliness. I'm going to go finish uh, my, my apple treat and I will speak to you again soon. Bye bye.